All right, so with this video, I've had a few issues. First time I had some issues technically um, because a video or ran out of space because I hadn't deleted the past videos. It's all confusing. Um, but I got everything there fixed. Then I tried, um, and that was actually kind of good that I have had to um, have that issue there because I was originally going to break this theorem up into two videos, and I don't like doing that if I don't have to. Um, then I tried this again, and then I realized there was an issue with the proof. Um, and it's because this, this proof is really tricky, um, although it's, it's not too difficult. It's just the, the details. It's easy to get them mixed up. So anyways, what the theorem is, is if you've got a permutation pi and you write it in two different ways as a product of transpositions, so here we've got p transpositions and here we've got q of them, um, then those two numbers are going to be equivalent mod 2, i.e. they're either both even or they're both odd. And how we're going to prove that is I claim that p is equivalent to um, this n of pi mod 2, n of pi, um, I mentioned that, in the I defined it in the last video it's how many permutation or it's it's one it's how many transpositions you can use to write um, pi using a particular um, uh, method of breaking it up into transpositions uh, but anyways so I claim this is equivalent to n pi mod p, and then once we know that, then writing p in these two different ways, we get that both p is equivalent to n pi and q is equivalent to n pi mod um, 2, Ugh, equivalent, congruent, whatever. Um, so then once you have that, you have p is equivalent to, p is congruent to n pi, which is congruent to p, to, to q mod 2, and so you have the theorem. So anyways, the first thing we do is this calculation here. Um, and this is sort of what happens if you've got, you're, you're looking at two indices A, B, and you want to see how you could write this cycle that contains two indices as some cycles where you've got those two indices in a transposition. And it turns out that this works. Here, the A, A B, all the CIs and all the DIs are distinct. Um, but let's go through and make sure that this agrees. So here, A gets mapped to C1. Here, we, we start right and go left, A gets mapped to C1, and then C1 doesn't appear in any of the others, and so they agree. Um, we've got a CI for I between 1 and K minus 1, then it'll go to CI plus 1 here, and it'll go to CI plus 1 here, and then it'll stay there. Um, CK here goes to B. Here we have CK going to A, but then later down here, A goes to B, and so CK goes to B. Um, B goes to D1. Here we have B goes to D1, it stays there. For I between 1 and L minus 1, DI goes to DI plus 1. DI goes to DI plus 1 and stays there. Then DL here goes to A. And DL here goes to B, which then goes to A. And so these are equal. Okay, so that's that. And then if you just multiply these this equation on the left by the transposition AB, what you get is AB times this is equal to, well, here the... A, B's will cancel out, and then you just get the last two things. Okay, so we have that. Now, suppose A and B are any indices, and you take any permutation, and you write it using disjoint cycles, and you write it in such a way that you include all the indices. So even if sigma doesn't, if, if there are some number of indices which sigma doesn't move, write those out. Um... And the reason we do that is, um, by the way, th th this formula will apply if k or l are zero, um, because you just you just move past the k's or the the c's there. Uh, you can you can just check that here. If 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 k if we've got no c's here, then a goes to b, and then here a will well this won't change a at all, and then a will go to b here. Um, here, if l is zero, then b will go to a. And here, B won't get changed at all here, and B will go to A here. So that, that's why it works. So anyways, uh, so now, A, so if we write sigma using disjoint cycles, but we include all 
of the indices, then A and B are going to appear somewhere in sigma. And if we take, so, so there's two cases. Because A and B must appear in this um, expression for sigma, either they're going to be in the same cycle or they're going to be in different cycles. If they're in the same cycle, what we're going to do is when we take sigma, sigma is unique up to ordering, so we can just put the cycle that contains both A and B at the front. And without loss of generality, we can assume that it looks like this. So sigma looks like this for some CIs and DIs, and then it's also multiplied on the right by a whole bunch of other uh, disjoint um, cycles, potentially. Um, so then what happens in this scenario? Uh, if we evaluate n at sigma, then first of all we evaluate n at this cycle and we see we have k plus l plus 1 plus 1 so that's k plus k plus l plus 2 but then we subtract 1 from that because it's a cycle and so we get k plus l plus 1 and then to that we're going to add some number m which is going to come from uh, finding the number of transpositions that you get when you look at those other um, cycles that might also be included in sigma um, all the cycles that do not include A and B. Um, so we have that, and then if we multiply on the left by A, B, then what we're doing is we're in this scenario, and well, multiplying on the left by A, B, you can write it like this. So you've got um, these two uh, cycles and we're multiplying them together how many things do we what's what is n applied to these two we've got l we've got l plus one and so that's going to be just l and this is k plus one and so that's just going to be k and so you get this k plus l but then you also have to add on that same m because that's just what you get for all the cycles that don't include a and b um, but anyways, k plus l plus m, that's precisely n sigma minus 1. Okay, so, so if a and b appear in the same cycle, then n of sigma equals n of, no, n of a, b sigma equals n of sigma minus 1. If a, b appear in different cycles, then what you do is you take those two cycles where, where they appear, and because of disjointness, you shift them all the way up to the front of the line and it looks like this um, without loss of generality and so what is n of sigma? n of sigma is here we've got l and here we've got k so we've got l plus k and then of course we have to add m because m is uh, the number of transpositions that we get when we look at all the cycles that don't include either a or b and so then from there, we look at what happens when we multiply by AB. Well, when we multiply this on the left by AB, we get this, which is equal to this. And N applied to this is, we calculated this already, K plus L plus 1. Um, and so this is, so really the way I should write this is this is K plus L plus 1, because that's what we get when we look at that a, B, and then that, the um, A, B times those first two um, transposition, or uh, cycles that appear there. Um, and then you still have all those other cycles at the end there that, um, those cycles at the end there that do not include A or B. Or actually, and this is important actually, they don't include any of the CIs or the DIs either. Um, so they just stay there and they contribute what they contributed last time. Um, and so then we write this as uh, the, the L plus K plus M part combined to give you N sigma. So, so this is N sigma plus one. Okay, so this tells us when you multi, so therefore when you take a cycle or you take a permutation and you multiply by a transposition, the, 
this val the value of n here is either going to go up by 1 or go down by 1. And that's really important because what we're going to do here is... Oh, and by the way, the reason that we need to use these two equations is because if you if you try to apply n to this, you can't do it because this is not disjoint. You need to go to here to make it, uh, to write it in terms of disjoint cycles. Um, so that's an aside um, to, to why we had to do this. Um, anyway, so now we prove the theorem and we're just going to induct on p. Um, if p is zero, I love this when you do an induction proof and for the in, for the base case you can do like a super trivial thing. Um, so when p equals zero, then pi is just the empty product which we define to be the trivial um, transposition, which makes sense because it's you just get it by not doing anything and so it can't move any indices around. So it's trivial. And so n applied to pi is going to be zero because the, um, the, zero, the, the zero, the identity permutation doesn't consist of any transpositions. Now we suppose, oh wait, what are, what are we trying to prove? We're trying to prove p is equivalent to n pi. Um, yeah, mod 2. And so 0 is equivalent to congruent to 0 mod 2, mod pi, I don't know. Um, so I don't know why I said mod pi, I meant mod 2. Um, but yeah, so that's it. Um, now suppose we induct, we suppose we have some p greater than or equal to 0, such that if you write pi as a transposition that has p trans, as a product of p many transpositions, then p is going to be equivalent to n pi mod 2, congruent, whatever. Um, and now you consider a permutation consisting of p plus 1 transpositions. But you can write it as one particular transposition times the product of the others, which is, and we'll call that pi prime. So pi prime here is tau 2 through tau p plus 1. And this tau prime has p transpositions because you're just taking p plus 1 and subtracting 1. And so p, by the inductive hypothesis, um, p is equivalent to n pi prime uh, mod 2. And so then we can apply the result from uh, before to see that, okay, so if we want to find n of pi, then, okay, so that's n of tau 1 of pi prime. So what's going to happen when we multiply pi prime by tau 1? Well, that's exactly, we let pi prime be sigma, and um, is that all right? Um, Pi prime here does not need to have. This is the thing that I keep getting mixed up on. Um, pi prime does not. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's the the reason this is okay is because we used. Okay, we used the um, the expression of sigma using disjoint cycles as a way to compute these formulas for n sigma and for n of a b sigma. Once we have those formulas, we don't need to write, we don't need to have any th relation between, we, we don't need to be, we don't need sigma to be written in any special form in order to use um, the theorem. So that's really nice because um, here, pi prime, um, these, these uh, taus in general, these, these taus are going to overlap. They're not going to be disjoint, but that's fine. We can still apply this result that the, these, these uh, computations that we proved. Um, it's just that 
um, the method of proof for these involves you to write things differently than how they might appear here. Um, but the main point is, uh, like, you, that that should like set off a flag in your head of like, oh, this pi prime is not written using disjoint cycles in general. Can we still apply this? And the answer is yes, we can still apply those computations. So, anyways, n pi equals tau 1 pi prime, and we know that you take any permutation and you multiply by a transposition. doesn't matter how they look, you just multiply by any transposition, and um, n of pi prime, it's either going to go up by 1 or down by 1. And whatever happens, like if you want to know which one happens, then you have to like go through this process and write it as... Um, what it will depend on is, it will depend on if you were to write pi prime, as disjoint cycles, then would the indices in tau 1 appear in the same cycles or would they appear in different cycles? Um, so if you wanted to actually figure out whether this was plus 1 or minus 1, then you would need to know the disjoint, um, what the um, pi prime looks like in terms of disjoint cycles. But we don't care because if you take any number that number plus 1 and that number minus 1, those two values are going to be equivalent mod 2. So then, what we have, finally, is n of pi equals n of pi prime plus or minus 1, and we don't care which one. In either case, let's see here, what did we have from before? We had p is congruent to n pi mod 2, and so p plus 1 is congruent to n pi plus 1, mod 2, which is of course congruent to n pi minus 1 mod 2, and so what those cases give us is that n pi prime plus or minus 1, each of those are going to be uh, congruent to p plus 1 mod 2. And so that's what we wanted to prove because pi is written using p plus 1 transpositions, and so that completes the inductive step, and so um, our induction um, argument is done, and so therefore, if you write pi using transpositions, then any two different ways of writing pi and using transpositions um, will agree on their order, They'll, well, on their parity. They'll either both be even or both be odd. They'll either both consist of an even number of transpositions or they'll both consist of an odd number of transpositions. And that completes this proof.